Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If I could ask everyone to take their seat, please. My name is Janet Brown. I'm executive director of the Commission on Presidential Debates, and I'd like to welcome you to the first presidential debate of 2020. There are a lot of people who have made extraordinary contributions to making this evening possible. And in a few moments, you will hear from two of our co-chairs to start the appreciation to those who have helped. Our third co-chair, Dot Ridings, is in Louisville, Kentucky tonight. Her leadership in debates goes back to 1976 and includes the presidency of the League of Women Voters. The CPD is the beneficiary of 33 years worth of people who have been willing to put their name on our work. To all of those former presidents and chancellors of debate sites, to former moderators, to members of our Debates International Network who have set their clocks to 3 a.m. tomorrow morning to tune in live, we thank you with all our hearts. In 1987, Paul Kirk and Frank Ferenkopf co-founded the CPD. I'd like to introduce the Co-chair Frank Ferenkopf and his colleague are also our co-chair, Ken Wallach, to start this part of the program.
Thank you, Janet, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Health Education Campus, Case Western Reserve, and the Cleveland Clinic. And if you have not had the opportunity yet to go around and see this fantastic facility, you really should. It's just a great tribute to everyone who's been involved with it, and it's so important to our nation. To say, as Janet mentioned, that this has been the most challenging time for this commission in its 33 years of existence due to the coronavirus problems. Uh, so many people, as Janet said, are responsible. We normally don't come out when uh, my co-chairman and I come out and thank people, but we wouldn't be here today if it had not been for them. As we serve as both the sponsor and the producers of the debates, we have a crew of 65 people, most of which have been with us for years. Some of them go back to the first debates in 1988. And thanks so much to United Airlines, who stepped up to the plate and graciously provided to fly our whole crew from one site to another throughout the rest of the term of these debates. So we have a great shout out for United Airlines. Anheuser-Busch has been with us for 28 years as has the firm of Crowell and Mooring in Washington, D.C. Also special thanks to some people in the network business, in the journalism business, Pentagram, CBS News Radio, and Intercom Communications. In the hotel behind us, the Intercontinental, there's a tremendously large room, which is called the Media Filing Center. There's only, I guess, is about 700 people in there today. We usually have three to 5,000 people in the media filing center. And so with uh, the cut down that we've had, to, and you can look around this audience, we normally have 900 people in the audience. You people are very fortunate to have the opportunity to be, to be here tonight. But the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. tonight is hosting a media filing center for those journalists in Washington who couldn't be here tonight. And so we're very, very thankful for that. Many of you, I see faces here I've known and been in the audience before. There will be, in the estimate of most experts, close to 120 million people watching this debate this evening. It'll be on their TV sets, it'll be on their computers, it'll be on their iPads, it'll be on their iPhones, it'll be listening on the radio. And those 120 million, or however it works out to be, deserve to be able to listen and observe on this stage tonight, these two men put forth the reasons why they should be elected president of the United States. And that's why it's been our history in the general election debates that we urge our audiences not to clap, not to yell, to sit silently and not interfere with these people who are trying to ascertain uh, who they're going to vote for. Now, exactly at nine o'clock, you're going to hear a lot of noise behind you. If you turn around now, you can take a quick look. At, there's three on this side and three on this side, and these are the major nets. And at nine sharp, you're going to hear them all go on air. And so it makes a little noise, so don't be afraid by it. And I must, at the end, really thank the people that you saw on your way here tonight and you see around here. The United States Secret Service, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Department of Homeland Security, and Clemson University Media Forensic Hub that is working with us and monitoring the, the web and social media. So there's so many people to thank, and these men and women, and the police department that you saw outside, the local police department, who worked so hard to keep us all safe and to keep our nation safe. So thanks, and now I'd like to introduce my, the newest member of the leadership team, Ken Wallach, who for 25 years ran the National Democratic Institute of International Affairs, NDI, and we're really excited to have him join us as co-chair. I join Frank, uh, Janet, and fellow board members, including Yvonne Howe and Jane Harmon, who are with us tonight in welcoming you to the 23rd presidential debate sponsored and organized by the Commission on Presidential Debates. As Frank said, I am the Commission's newest co-chair and as the new kid on the block, I am proud to work alongside those who have been engaged in this initiative for the past 33 years. These debates have now become 
an integral part of our political process, a view shared by the most important judge, the American electorate. But as significant as debates have become here, they can be even more consequential overseas, where the Commission, in partnership with the National Democratic Institute, has helped organize more than 400 debates in 45 nations. In post-conflict countries and in new and emerging democracies, debates have helped level the playing field in places where only one party has ruled. They have forced discussion on policy issues, not personalities. And yes, they have promoted comity among political competitors. And that's comity with a T. And this effort has spawned the establishment of a global support network of similar debate organizations from nearly 40 countries, dubbed Debates International. Now I would call your attention to the commission-sponsored Debate Watch 2020 and the participation by watch groups in all 50 states. From a hair salon owner in Cleveland Heights hosting 10 employees to the Atlantic Council hosting a global audience for more than 80,000. The goal of the debate watch is not to say who won or who lost, but to share views with those who agree and those who don't, to listen respectfully to each other's opinions. We are pleased that the Commission's longest standing supporters, Judy and Peter Kovler, are in the audience tonight. For for 32 years, the Judy and Peter Blum Kovler Foundation has given its trust to the nonpartisan mission of the Commission. We are deeply grateful for their belief in our work and their extraordinary contribution to the 2020 debates. It is now my distinct honor to introduce Dr. Tom Mahalovich president of the Cleveland Clinic, and Barbara Snyder, president of Case Western Reserve University. Thank you very much. Good evening. On behalf of Cleveland Clinic, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the city of Cleveland. Tonight, you join us in the beautiful Samson Pavilion of the Health Education Campus at Cleveland Clinic. We share this uh, campus with our partners from Case Western Reserve University. This building is very special to us. It was opened just a year ago as a place for students, medical, nursing, and dental, to begin their professional journeys by learning together as teams. At that time, as we were opening this campus, none of us could have imagined that we would soon face a worldwide pandemic. When it happened, we converted this building into a COVID-19 surge hospital. The space in which you are sitting right now had 1,000 hospital beds. We called it the Hope Hospital. Thankfully, the surge did not come in Ohio. Yet tonight, this building serves another purpose, in support of our democracy, and it is a historic occasion for us and for our city. We are proud to support the Commission on Presidential Debates as their health security advisor. We at Cleveland Clinic and our 70,000 caregivers have been serving the health needs in Cleveland since 1921 nearly 100 years. Yet, our organization and our caregivers have never shone brighter than during this pandemic. The pandemic has brought out the best of our organization and our caregivers of our city and our state. Through partnership and collaboration, we see how much we can accomplish when we work together. And we are particularly proud of our partnership with Case Western Reserve University. With that, I would like to introduce my colleague and friend, President of Case Western Reserve University, Barbara Snyder.
Thank you, Tom. Case Western Reserve is honored to co-host this presidential debate with our partners at Cleveland Clinic and delighted to show you this spectacular space we created together. Research has long shown that team-based healthcare leads to better outcomes for patients. Yet nearly every academic institution continues to prepare students in separate buildings, literally in silos. Yet after spending years learning only with students from the same profession, doctors with doctors, nurses with nurses, and so on, they are suddenly expected to know how to work in teams once they get their diplomas. We knew there had to be a better way, and together we built it. When not filled with a stage and seats, this atrium gives hundreds of students a huge open space to study, talk, and simply be together. The entire building provides mul multiple spaces for them to come together, supported by an academic model that emphasizes opportunities to learn with and from one another. Add state-of-the-art technology, and we know our graduates will be uniquely prepared to excel in team-based care and ultimately to lead it. Along the way, Cleveland Clinic and Case Western Reserve also learned from one another. Among the most valuable lessons was that through collaboration, we achieve far more than either of us could achieve alone. Thank you, Tom, for being such a wonderful colleague and friend. Thank you to the Commission for giving both of our organizations the opportunity to be part of this historic event. It is a true privilege to contribute to our nation's democratic process. And thank you all for watching. Thank you, Tom and Barbara, very much. Um, most valuable player uh, award for this evening goes to Toby Cos Cosgrove. We couldn't have done it without you. Thank you. One housekeeping bit for the audience. Uh, as soon as this debate is over, if you will please remain seated, you will be shown which way to exit. Um, and please stay where you are until that happens. I would like to now introduce Chris Wallace, the moderator of this evening's debate.
Good evening from the health education campus of Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Clinic. I'm Chris Wallace of Fox News, and I welcome you to the first of the 2020 presidential debates between President Donald J. Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden. This debate is sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates. The Commission has designed the format, six roughly 15-minute segments, with two-minute answers from each candidate to the first question, then open discussion for the rest of each segment. Both campaigns have agreed to these rules. For the record, I decided the topics and the questions in each topic. I can assure you none of the questions has been shared with the commission or the two candidates. This debate is being conducted under health and safety protocols designed by the Cleveland Clinic which is serving as the health security advisor to the commission for all four debates. As a precaution, both campaigns have agreed the candidates will not shake hands at the beginning of tonight's debate. The audience here in the hall has promised to remain silent. No cheers, no boos or other interruptions, so we, and more importantly you, can focus on what the candidates have to say. No noise except right now as we welcome the Republican nominee, President Trump, and the Democratic nominee, Vice President Biden. Gentlemen, a lot of people have been waiting for this night, so let's get going. Our first subject is the Supreme Court. President Trump, you nominated Amy Coney Barrett over the weekend to succeed the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the court. You say the Constitution is clear about your obligation and the Senate's to consider a nominee to the court. Vice President Biden, you say that this is an effort by the President and Republicans to jam through in an appointment and what you call an abuse of power. My first question to both of you tonight, why are you right in the argument you make and your opponent wrong, and where do you think a Justice Barrett would take the court? President Trump, in this first segment, you go first, two minutes. Thank you very much, Chris. I will tell you very simply, we won the election. Elections have consequences. We have the Senate, we have the White House, and we have a phenomenal nominee, respected by all, top, top academic, uh, good in every way, good in every way. In fact, uh, some of her biggest endorsers are very liberal people from Notre Dame and other places. So I think she's going to be fantastic. We have plenty of time, uh, even if we did it after the election itself. I have a lot of time after the election, as you know. So I think that uh, she will be outstanding. She's going to be uh, as good as anybody that has served on that court. We really feel that. Uh, we have a professor at Notre Dame, highly respected by all, said she's the single greatest student he's ever had. He's been a professor for a long time at a great school. And uh, we just, uh, we won the election, and therefore we have the right to choose her. And very few people knowingly would say otherwise. And by the way, the Democrats, they wouldn't even think about not doing it. If they had, the only difference is to try and do it faster. There's no way they would give it up. They had Merritt Garland, but the problem is they didn't have the election, so they were stopped. And probably that would happen in reverse also. Definitely would happen in reverse. So we won the election, and we have the right to do it, Chris. President Trump, thank you. Um, same question to you, Vice President Biden. You have two minutes. Well, first of all, um, thank you for doing this and looking thank forward you. to this, Mr. President. Thank you, Joe. I, uh, the American people have a right to have a say in who the Supreme Court nominee is. And that say occurs when they vote for a United States senators and when they vote for the President of the United States. They're not going to get that chance now because we're in the middle of an election already. 
election has already started. Tens of thousands of people have already voted. And so the thing that should happen is we should wait. We should wait and see what the outcome of this election is, because that's the only way the American people get to express their view is by who they elect as president and who they elect as vice president. Now, what's at stake here is the president's made it clear he wants to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. He's been running on that, he ran on that, and he has been governing on that. He's in the Supreme Court right now trying to get rid of uh, the, uh, the Affordable Care Act, which uh, will strip 20 million people from having insurance, health insurance now, if it, if they, if it goes into court. And, and uh, the justice, and I have nothing, I'm not opposed to the justice, but she seems like a very fine person. But she's written before she went in the bench, which is her right, that she thinks that the Affordable Care Act is not constitutional. The other thing that's on the court, and if, if, if it's struck down, what happens? Women's rights are fundamentally changed. Once again, a woman could be held, pay more money because she has a pre-existing condition of pregnancy. We were able to, they were able to charge a woman more for the same exact procedure a man did, gets. And that ended when we, in fact, passed the Affordable Care Act. And there's 100 million people who have pre-existing conditions, and they'll be taken away as well. Those pre-existing conditions, the insurance companies are going to love this. And so it's just not appropriate to do this before this election. If he wins the election and the Senate is Democrat or Republican, then it, he goes forward. If not, we should wait until February. All right. There aren't 100 million people with pre-existing conditions. As far as the say is concerned, the people already had their say. They — okay. Justice Ginsburg said very powerfully, very strongly, at some point, 10 years ago or so, she said a president and the Senate is elected for a period of time. But a president's elected for four years. We're not elected for three years. I'm not elected for three years. So we have the Senate. We have a president. He's elected to the next During election. that period of time, during that period of time, we have an opening. I'm not elected for three years. I'm elected for four years. The and the 100 million started. people, Joe, the 100 million people is totally wrong. I don't know where you got that number. The bigger problem that you have is that you're going to extinguish 180 million people with their private health care, that they're very That's happy That's simply with. not true. Well, you're certainly you know, going, to you're going to socialist. You're going to socialist this is, we're, we're now into, gentlemen, we're now into open discussion. Open discussion. Open discussion. Yes, I agree. Go ahead, Vice President. Number Biden. one, uh, he, he knows that uh, what I proposed. What I proposed is that uh, we expand Obamacare and we increase it. We do not wipe any. And one of the big debates we had with 23 of my colleagues trying to win the nomination that I won were saying that Biden wanted to allow people to have private insurance still. They can. They do. They will under my proposal. It's not what you've said, but and it's not what your party is, has said. That is simply Your party a lie. doesn't say it. Your party wants simple. to go socialist my party is and me. And socialist right health care. Right now, I am and the And they're going to dominate party. you, Joe. You know that. I am the Democratic Party right now. The platform of the Democratic Party Harris. is what I, in fact, approved of. What I approved of. Now, here's the deal. The deal is that it's going to wipe out pre-existing conditions. And by the way, the 20, the 200 million, the 200,000 people that have died on his watch, how many of those have survived? Well, there's 7 million people that contracted COVID. What does it mean for them going forward if he strike down the Affordable Care Act. And Joe, you've had 308,000 military people dying because you couldn't provide them proper health care in the military. So don't tell me I'm about this. I'm happy to talk about And this. if you were here, Look, you, it wouldn't be deal. 200. It would be 2 million people because you were very late on the draw. You late didn't want me draw. to ban China, which was heavily infected. You didn't want me to ban All right, we're, gentlemen, Europe, we're, we're, which no, was heavily Mr. President, infected. You would Mr. have been President, much later, Joe. Mr. President, much later. Mr. President. You're talking about 2 million people. You're Mr. Not President, as a moderator, <laughs> we are going to talk about COVID in the next segment, but, but go ahead. Let me finish. The point is that the president also is opposed to Roe v. Wade. That's on the ballot as well in the court, in the court. And so that's also at stake right now. And so the election is all You don't know it's begun. on the ballot. I, Why is it on the ballot? Because, because Why is you it on the ballot? It's not on the ballot. It's on the ballot in the I court. I don't think so. In the court. Well, There's nothing happening there. Donald, would you and just you don't know her me? view on Roe v. Wade. You I don't, don't know, know her view. Well, all right. Let's, all right. Let's talk. I would, we got a lot to unpack here, gentlemen. We got a lot of time. So, <laughs> uh, on health care, 
and then we'll come back to Roe v. Wade. All right. Mr. President, the Supreme Court will hear a case a week after the election in which the Trump administration, along with 18 state attorneys general, are seeking to overturn That's right. Obamacare, to end Obamacare. You have spent the last... Because they want to give I, good health care. If I may ask right. my question, sir. Good health care. Over uh, the last four years, you have promised to repeal and replace Obamacare, but you have never in these four years come up with a plan, a comprehensive plan yes, to I replace have. Obamacare. Of course I have. Well, I'll I give got you rid of the I'm individual finish, mandate. I'm going to give you Excuse an opportunity. Excuse me. I got I... rid of the individual mandate, which was a that big is not chunk a of Obamacare. Obama. That is absolutely a big thing. That was the worst I, I part of Obamacare. Sir, Chris, that was the him, worst part me. of Obamacare. Let me ask my question. Well, I'll, I'll ask Joe. I, 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 the individual no, mandate I, was the most unpopular Vice aspect of Obamacare. I got rid of it. I'd like you and to, we will protect Mr. people. President, I'm the moderator of this debate, and I would like you to let me ask my question, and then you can answer your question. You, in the course of these four years, have never come up with a comprehensive plan to replace Obamacare. And just this last Thursday, you signed a largely symbolic executive order That's to protect symbolic. people with pre-existing conditions five days before this debate. So my question, sir, is what is the Trump health care plan? Right. Well, first of all, I guess I'm debating you, not him, but that's okay. I'm not surprised. Let me just tell you something, that <laughs> there's nothing symbolic. I'm cutting drug prices. I'm going with favored nations, which no president has the courage to do because you're going against Big Pharma. Drug prices will be coming down 80 or 90 percent. You could have done it during your 47-year period in government, but you didn't do it. <laughs> Nobody's done it. So we're cutting health care. All of the things conditions. that we've done, insulin. Not cut I give you an example, insulin. It's going to, it was destroying families, destroying people, the cost. I'm getting it for so cheap. It's like water, you want to know the truth. So cheap. Take a look <laughs> at all of the drugs that, what we're doing, prescription drug prices. We're going to allow our governors now to go to other countries to buy drugs okay. because when they fact, pay just a I, tiny fraction. As I say, this is open do. discussion. No, let but me this ask is you big, about, let me, this you'll is be happy, big stuff. Sir, you'll be happy. I'm about to pick up on one of your points to ask the vice president, which is he points out that you would like to add a public option to Obamacare. And yes. the argument that he makes and other Republicans make is that that is going to end private insurance. It is and not. Will, if I'm I sorry. ask you the question, it will not end. What your party says, by the way. It will end private insurance and create a government takeover of health care. It does not. It's that. only for those people who are so poor they qualify for Medicaid, they can get that free in most states, except governors who want to deny people who are poor Medicaid. Anyone who qualifies for Medicare would, me, me, excuse me, Medicaid would automatically be enrolled in the public option. The vast majority of the American people would still not be in that option, number one. Joe, you agreed two, with Bernie number, Sanders, I, who's I, far I left, on the manifesto, when, when we you, call it. And that gives you socialized medicine. Look, hey, Are I, you I'm not going to listen to him. The fact of the matter is, I beat Bernie Sanders. Not by I'm, much. I, I beat him a whole hell of a lot. I'm here, I'm here standing facing Pocahontas you, buddy. Pocahontas would have left well, two days early. You, you would have lost every primary All he knows how to do Super is hurt. Tuesday. You got Look, very lucky. here's the deal. I got very lucky. I'm going to get very lucky tonight as well. And tonight I'm going With to make what? sure, because here's the deal. Here's the deal. The fact is that everything he's saying so far is simply a lie. I'm not here to call out his lies. Everybody knows he's a liar. But you I agree. just want to hey, make sure. Joe, you're the liar. I, 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 I want to make sure. You graduated last in your class, I, not I, first in your I, class. <laughs> I want to make Mr. sure. Mr. President, can you let him finish, sir? No, he doesn't know how yeah. to do that. He has, You'd you know, surprised. You, you picked You'd be surprised. the go wrong ahead, guy, the wrong go night go. at the wrong time. Listen, you agreed with Here's Bernie Sanders to the manifesto. The whole idea. Let, let him, there it. is no manifesto, number Please one. Please let him speak, Mr. President. Number two. You just lost the left. Number two. I, I, you just lost the left. You agreed with Bernie Sanders on a plan how, uh, folks, that's this, absolutely agreed folks, to. Folks, do you have any and idea what this clown is doing? Call it Mr. Medicare, do you have any do? Socialized medicine. Mr. President. I'll tell you what. He is not for any help for people needing health care. Because, because he, in fact, already has cost 10 million people their health care that they had from their employers because of his recession. Number one. Number oh, two, oh, yeah, yeah. there are 20 million people getting health care through Obamacare now that he wants to take it away. He won't ever look you in the eye and say that's what he wants to do. 
take it away. No, I want to give Number them better health care at a much lower price but, because and by Obamacare the way, he doesn't is no know good. how he doesn't know how I've to do that. I've already fixed it. He has never I've offered a plan. Fixed it to an extent. He has Obamacare, never done a single thing. Obamacare, as you might thing. know, but probably don't. No, Obamacare is no good. you realize if you're both speaking at the same time, and it's too expensive. Let the president go ahead, sir. Obamacare is no good. We made it better, and I had a choice to make very early on. We took away the individual mandate. We guarantee pre-existing conditions, but took away the individual mandate. Listen, this is the way it is. <laughs> and that destroyed that they shouldn't even call it Obamacare. Then I had a choice to make. Do I let my people run it really well or oh, badly? Yeah. If I run it badly, they'll probably blame him, but they'll blame me. But more importantly, I want to help people. OK, I said, you got to run that, it so well. That's what and I for. just had a meeting with them. They said the problem is no matter how well you run Obamacare, it's a disaster. It's too expensive. Okay. Premiums are too it. high, that's and it doesn't work. That's so we we do I, want no, to get no. rid of it. I, we, well, Chris, we want to get rid of it. I understand it, sir, but I have to I have to give better. you roughly so, equal time. Good. Please let the vice president talk. Good. He has no plan for health care. Of course he we do. Sends, please. He sends out wishful thinking. He has executive orders that have no power. He hasn't lowered drug costs for anybody. He's been promising a health care plan since he got elected. He has none, like almost everything else he talks about. He does not have a plan. He doesn't have a plan. And the fact is, this man doesn't know what he's talking about. All right. He's I, have one, I have one final question for you, sure. uh, Mr. Vice President. If Senate Republicans, we were talking originally about the Supreme Court here, if Senate Republicans go ahead and confirm Justice Barrett, uh, there has been talk about ending the filibuster or even packing the court, adding to the nine justices there. You call this a distraction by the president, but in fact, it wasn't brought up by the president. It was brought up by some of your Democratic colleagues in, well, the, saying, in the Congress. So my question to you is, you have refused in the past to talk about it. Are you willing to tell the American people tonight whether or not you will support either ending the filibuster or packing the court? Whatever position I take on that, that'll become the issue. The issue is the American people should speak. You should go out and vote. You're in voting now. Vote and let your senators know how you strongly you feel. Court? Let Vote now. Are you pack the Make court? sure you, in fact, let people know he doesn't you're want to a senator. The question. I'm not going to answer the question Why because, would you answer that because question? the question you is. The question 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 is. Keep yapping, man. The people understand, Joe. <laughs> they sure 47 do. years, you've Je done nothing. They understand. Oh. All right. The second subject <laughs> is COVID-19, which is an awfully serious subject. So let's try to be serious about it. We have had more than 7 million cases of coronavirus in the United States, and more than 200,000 people have died. Even after we produce a vaccine, experts say that it could be months or even years before we come back to anything approaching normal. My question for both of you is, based on what you have said and done so far and what you have said you would do starting in 2021, why should the American people trust you more than your opponent to deal with this public health crisis going forward? In this case, the question goes to you first, sir. Two minutes uninterrupted. Good luck. 200,000 dead, as you said, over 7 million infected in the United States. We, in fact, have 5 percent, 4 percent of the world's population, 20 percent of the deaths. 40,000 people a day are contracting COVID. In addition to that, about between 750 and 1,000 people a day are dying. When he was presented with that number, he said, it is what it is. Well, it is what it is because you are who you are. That's why it is. The president has no plan. He hasn't laid out anything. He knew all the way back in February how serious this crisis was. He knew it was a deadly disease. What did he do? He's on tape as acknowledging he knew it. He said he didn't tell us or give people a warning of it because he didn't want to panic the American people. You don't panic. He panicked. In addition to that, what did he do? He went in and he we were insisting that the Chinese, the, the people we had on the ground in China should be able to go to Wuhan and determine for themselves how dangerous this was. 
He did not even ask Xi to do that. He told us what a great job Xi was doing. He said we owe him a debt of gratitude for being so transparent with us. And what did he do then? He then did nothing. He, he waited and waited and waited. He still doesn't have a plan. Well, I laid yeah, out sir, back in March so, exactly so what wrong. we should be doing. And I laid out again in July what we should be doing. We should be providing all the protective gear possible. We should be providing the money the House has passed in order to be able to go out and get people the help they need to keep their businesses open, open schools that cost a lot of money. You should get out of your bunker and get out of the sand trap and get in, in your golf course and go in the Oval Office and bring together the Democrats and Republicans and fund what needs to be done now to save lives. So if wait, we wait, would have listened wait, to wait. you. You have two minutes, sir. If we would have listened to you, the country would have been left wide open. Millions of people would have died, not 200,000. And one person is too much. It's China's fault. It should have never happened. They stopped it from going in, but it was China's fault. And by the way, when you talk about numbers, you don't know how many people died in China. You don't know how many people died in Russia. You don't know how many people died in India. They don't exactly give you a straight count, just so you understand. But if you look at what we've done, I closed it, and you said he's xenophobic. He's a racist, and he's xenophobic, because you it's didn't think I should have closed our country. Wait, no, Wait a minute. It says two minutes. You didn't think we should have closed our country, because you thought it was too — it was terrible. You wouldn't have closed it for another two months. By my doing it early — in fact, Dr. Fauci said, President Trump saved thousands of lives. Many of you, a Democrat governor, said, President Trump did a phenomenal job. We worked with the governor. Oh, really? Go take a look. <laughs> the governor said I did a phenomenal job. Most of them said that. In <laughs> fact, people that would not be necessarily on my side said that. President Trump did a phenomenal job. We did. We got the gowns. We got the masks. We made the ventilators. You wouldn't have made ventilators. And now we're weeks away from a vaccine. We're doing therapeutics already. Fewer people are dying when they get sick. Far fewer people are dying. We've done a great job. The only thing I haven't done a good job, and that's because of the fake news, no matter what you say to them, they give you bad press on it. It's just fake news. They give you good press. They give me bad press, because that's the way it is, unfortunately. But let me just tell you something. I don't care. I've gotten used to it. But I'll tell you, Joe, you could never have done the job that we did. You don't have it in your blood. You could have never done that job. I know how to do the job. I know how to get the job done. Well, you done. didn't do very well in swine flu. H1N1, you were a disaster. Your own chief 14, of staff said 000, you were a disaster. 14,000 people died, not 200,000. There was a no very, economic wait, 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 recession. Sir, you made a, a there, far was, less there was no recession. Disease, you made a point. Way. Let and him answer there, it. And there was no one, there was no, we didn't shut down the economy. This is his economy that's being, he shut down. The reason it's shut down is because, look, you folks at home, how many of you got up this morning and had an empty chair at the kitchen table because someone died of COVID? How many of you were in a situation where you lost your mom or dad and you couldn't even speak to them? You had a nurse holding a phone up so you could, in fact, say goodbye. You would have lost far How more many people. people. Far that more is, people. And, you would have been And by the way, late. Your own, you his, 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 own, me, his own CDC director says we could lose as many as another 200,000 people between now and the end of the year. And he held up. He said, if we just wear a mask, we can save half those numbers. Just, just a mask. And by the way, in terms of the, the whole notion of a vaccine, we're for a vaccine, but we, I don't trust him at all, nor do you. I know you don't. What we trust is a scientist. You don't we trust, trust Dr. Johnson Fauci. Johnson, Pfizer. We, 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 and okay, by the way, gentlemen, and gentlemen that, let, me, let me move on to questions about the future, because you both have touched on one of the two of the questions I'm going to ask. Uh, t focusing on the future first, President Trump, you have repeatedly either contradicted or been at odds with some of your government's own top scientists. The week before last, the head of the Centers for Disease Control, Dr. Redfield, said it would be summer before the vaccine would become generally available to the public. You said that he was confused and mistaken. Those were your two words. Yeah. But Dr. Slowey, the head of your Operation Warp Speed, has said exactly the same thing. Are they both wrong? Well, I've spoken to the companies, and we can have it a lot sooner. It's a very political thing, because people like this would rather make it political than save lives. God. It is a very political thing. I've spoken to Pfizer. I've spoken to all of the people that you have to speak to. We have great Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, and others. They can go faster than that by a lot. 
become very political because the left, or I don't know if so, I call so them left, I don't know what I call them. So you're suggesting that the head of your operation, Warp Speed, Dr. Smalley? I disagree with him. Yeah. No, I disagree with both of them. And he didn't say that. He said it could be there, but it could also be much sooner. I, I had him in my he, office two days he talk, ago. He talked about the summer, sir, before it's generally available, just because like He Dr. said Redford. it's a possibility that we'll have the answer before November 1st. It could I'm, also I'm be after that. it's generally available. It, not well, we're going to deliver it right away. We have the military all set up logistically. They're all set up. We have our military that delivers soldiers, and they can do 200,000 a day. They're going to be this delivering. This is the same man it's who all told set you up. by Easter this would be gone away. By the warm weather, it'd be gone. Miraculous. It's like a miracle. And by the way, maybe you could inject some bleach in your arm, and that would take care of it. This is the that same man. That was said sarcastically, that was you seemed, know that. I, that I, was I, said sarcastically. And so here's the deal. This man is talking about a vaccine. Every serious... Every serious company is talking about maybe having a vaccine done by the end of the year. But the distribution of that vaccine will not occur until sometime beginning or the middle of next year to get it out, if we get the vaccine. And pray God we will. Pray but, God we Mr. will. Mr. Vice President, I want to pick up, though. You'll have on the that. vaccine I, I, I want to pick that. up on this question, though. You say the public can trust the scientists, but they can't trust President Trump. In fact, you said that again tonight. Your running mate, Senator Harris, goes further, saying the public health experts, quote, will be muzzled, will be suppressed. Given the fact that polls already show that people are concerned about the vaccine and are reluctant to take it, are you and your running mate, Senator Harris, contributing to that fear? No more than the question you just asked him. You pointed out. He puts pressure and disagrees with his own scientist. But you're saying Everybody you can't, or knows. Senator and Harris is saying no, you can't trust the scientist. No. Well, no, no, you can't trust the scientist. He didn't, she didn't say that, you can't she, trust She the, said the public health experts, quote, will be muzzled, will yes. be suppressed. Well, that's what he's gonna to try to do, but there's millions of scientists, there's thousands of scientists out there, like here at this great hospital, that don't work for him. Their job doesn't depend on him. That's not, they're the people, they're, and by I the way. I spoke to the scientists that are in charge. By the way. They will have the vaccine very soon. Does, Let him finish. Do you believe for a moment what he's telling you in light of all the lies he's told you about the whole issue relating to COVID? He still hasn't even acknowledged that he knew this was happening, knew how dangerous it was going to be back in February, and he didn't even tell you. He's on record as saying it. He panicked or he just looked at the stock market, one of the two, because guess what? A lot of people died, and a lot more are going to die unless he gets a lot smarter, a lot quicker. So, Mr. President? Did you use the word smart? Uh, so you said you went to Delaware State, but you forgot the name of your college. You didn't <laughs> go to so. Delaware State. You graduated either the lowest or almost the lowest in your class. Don't ever use the word smart with me. Don't ever use that word. Oh, give me a break. Because you know what? There's nothing smart about you, Joe. 47 years, you've done nothing. Well, let's have this debate. And if we'll you would have had, smart. let me just tell you something, Joe. No, if you would have had the charge of what I was put through, I had to close the greatest economy in the history of our country. And by the way, now it's being built again. You see, and it's going get up to the fast. economy in the next segment, sir. Okay. It's going up fast. Okay. Look forward to I, when it comes to how the virus has been handled so far, the two of you have taken very different approaches, and this is going to affect how the virus is handled going forward by whichever of you ends up becoming the next president. I want to quickly go through several of those. Reopenings. Vice President Biden, you have been much more reluctant than President Trump about reopening the economy and schools. Why, sir? Because he doesn't have a plan. If I were running, I'd know how, what the plan is. You've got to provide these businesses the ability to have the money to be able to reopen with the PPE, as well as with the sanitation they need. You have to provide them plastic. Tell that to Nancy Pelosi. To, to, well, he's just shush for a minute. Tell it to the, Nancy the, Pelosi and, and Schumer, by the way, Chuck. Nancy Pelosi and Schumer, they have a plan. He <laughs> won't even meet with them. The Republicans won't meet with okay. the Senate. But and he, and he, sits, he sits on his golf course. And, well, I mean, nah. literally, okay. think about it. You probably or, play more than it. I do, Joe. Uh, uh, oh. What about this question <laughs> of reopenings and the fact... Well, he wants to shut down this country. Oh. And I want to keep it open. And we you did get, a great thing by shutting it down. He shut it down. Wait a minute, Joe. Let, let, let me shut her. you down for a second, Joe, just for one second. <laughs> we want to... He wants to shut down the country. We just went through it. We had to, because we didn't know anything about the disease. Now we found that elderly people with heart problems and uh, diabetes and different problems are 
very, very vulnerable. We learned a lot. Young children aren't. Uh, even younger people aren't. We've learned a lot. But he wants to shut it down. More people will be hurt by continuing. If you look at Pennsylvania, if you look at certain states that have been shut down, they have Democrat governors all. One of the reasons they're shut down is because they want to keep it shut down until after the election on yeah. November 3rd. I want to move on to another subject. Because it's a political I want to move on to another subject. I've got to But those states, those states are not subject. doing well that are shut I've, down right now. I've got to respond uh, to that. President Trump, shut down you have country. begun to increasingly question the effectiveness of masks as a disease preventer. And in fact, recently you have cited the, the issue of, of waiters touching their masks and touching plates. Are you questioning the, no, I think the, the masks efficacy are okay. of, of masks? You have masks? to understand, if you look, I mean, I have a mask right here. I put a mask on, you know, when I think I need it. Tonight, as an example, everybody's had a test and you've had social distancing and all of the things that you have to, but I Just wear like masks rallies. when needed. When needed, I wear masks. Okay, let me ask. I don't have, to, I don't wear masks like him. Every time you see him, he's got a mask. He could be speaking 200 feet away from it. He shows up with the biggest mask I've ever seen. Uh, I will, <laughs> say, Vice, I will Vice, say this. Vice President Biden, go ahead, sir. Look, the way to open businesses is give them the wherewithal to be able to open. We provided money. The Congress but I was asking you, sir, about masks. Well, masks mask make a big difference. His own head of the CDC said if we just wore masks between now, if there, everybody wore masks in social distance between now and January, we'd probably save up to 100,000 lives. It matters. And they've also it said matters. the opposite. They've and also said no, the opposite. No serious person said the opposite. They've no also said, well, look, serious right, person. Dr. Fauci. Dr. Fauci said the he opposite. He did not I, I say the opposite. I want to ask you, we got a little bit more than a minute left in this masks segment. Masks are not good. Then he changed his mind. He said masks are good. I, I I'm okay ask, with masks. I'm I want to ask you both masks. about one last subject, because your different approaches has even affected the way that you have campaigned. Uh, President Trump, you're holding large rallies with crowds packed together, thousands of people. Outside. Outside, yes, sir, agreed. Uh, Vice President Biden, you are holding much smaller uh, events with- nobody will show up. People with- <laughs> What's well, true, with, nobody shows up to his rallies. Uh, all right, in any case, why you holding the big rallies, why you not? You go first, sir. Because people want to hear what I have to say. I mean, but are you I've done worried a great about job as a president, and I'll have 25, 35,000 people show up at airports. We use airports- Are you not worried about the disease We have a lot of issues, people. Sir. Well, so far, we have had no problem whatsoever. It's outside. That's a big difference, according to the experts. And we do them outside. We have tremendous crowds, as you see. I mean, every and, and literally on 24 hours notice. And Joe does the circles and has three people someplace. OK. Uh, by the way, did, this, you, did, this, did you see the, one of the last big rallies he had? And a reporter came up to him to ask him a question. He said, no, 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 stand back. Put on your mask. Put on a mask. Have you been tested? I'm way, I'm way far away from those other people. That's what he said. I can't. I, I'm going to be okay. He's not worried about you. He's not worried about the people out there breathing in one another. We've had no the negative effect. No, no negative, negative effect. effect. We've Come had on. no negative effect. And we've well, had 35, 40,000 right. people at any of these rallies. Just yes. quickly finish yeah. up because I want to move on to our next Yes, one. I would. He's been totally irresponsible the way in which he has handled the, the social distancing and people wearing masks, basically encouraged them not to. All right. Ben, he's a fool on this. If you could get the crowds, you would have done the same thing. But you can't. Nobody cares. Gentlemen, can we move on Nobody to the economy? Gentlemen, can we move on to the economy? Yes. The economy is, I think it's fair to say, recovering faster than expected from the shutdown. Much this, faster. In the second quarter, the unemployment rate fell to 8.4% last month. The Federal Reserve says the hit to, to growth, which is going to be there, is not going to be nearly as big as they had expected. President Trump, you say we are in a V-shaped recovery. Uh, Vice President Biden, you say it's more of a K-shape. What difference does that mean to the American people in terms of the economy? President Trump, in this segment, you go first. So we built the greatest economy in history. We closed it down because of the China plague. When the plague came in, we closed it down, which was very hard psychologically to do. He didn't think we should close it down, and he was wrong. And again, two million people would be dead now instead of still 204,000 people is too much. One person is too much. Should have never happened from China. But what happened is we closed it down and now we're reopening and we're doing record business. 
We had 10.4 million people in a four-month period that we've put back into the workforce. That's a record the likes of which nobody's ever seen before. And he wants to close down the — he will shut it down again. He will destroy this country. You know, a lot of people, between drugs and alcohol and depression, when you start shutting it down, you take a look at what's happening at some of your Democrat-run states where they have these tough shutdowns. And I'm telling you, it's because they don't want to open it. One of them came out last week. You saw that. Oh, we're going to open up on November 9th. Why November 9th? Because it's after the election. They think they're hurting us by keeping them closed. They're hurting people. People know what to do. They can social distance. They can wash the hands. They can wear masks. They can do whatever they want. But they got to open these states up. When you look at North Carolina, when you look — and these governors are under siege — Pennsylvania, Michigan, and a couple of others, you got to open these states up. It's not fair. You're talking about almost it's like being in prison. And you look at what's going on with divorce. Look at what's going on with alcoholism and drugs. It's a very, very sad thing. And he'll close down the whole country. This guy will close down the whole country and destroy our country. Our country is coming back incredibly well, setting records as it does it. We don't need somebody to come in and say, let's shut it down. All right. Your two minutes, sir. We're now moved to you. As I, as I said, posing the question, the president says it's a V-shaped recovery. You say it's a K-shaped recovery. What's the difference? The difference is millionaires and billionaires like him in the middle of the COVID crisis have done very well. Another billionaires have, raised, have made another $300 billion because of his profligate tax uh, uh, proposal, and he only focused on the market. But you folks at home, you folks living in Scranton and Claymont and all the small towns and working class towns in America, how well are you doing? This guy paid well, a total of seven hundred and fifty dollars in taxes. Sir, and sir, wait, wait, no, sir, it's just the wrong state. No, I understand. There, You've agreed to the two minutes, so please let him have it. Do I get my time back? The fact is that he has, in fact, worked on this in a way that he's going to be the first president of the United States to leave office, having fewer jobs in his administration than when he became president. Fewer jobs than when he became president. First one in American history. Secondly, the people who have lost their jobs are those people who have been on the front lines, those people who have been saving our lives, those people who have been out there dying, people who have been putting themselves in the way to make sure that we could all try to make it. And the idea that he is insisting that we go forward and open when you have almost half the states in America with a significant increase in COVID deaths and COVID cases in the United States of America. And he wants to open it up more. Why does he want to open it up? Why doesn't he take care of the America? You can't fix the economy until you fix the COVID crisis. And he has no intention of doing anything about making it better for you all at home in terms of your health and your safety. Schools, why aren't schools open? Because it costs a lot of money to open them safely. You know, they, they were going to give, his administration was going to give the teachers and school students masks. And then they decided, no, couldn't do that because it's not a national emergency not a national emergency. They've done nothing to help small businesses. Nothing. They're closing. One in six is now gone. He ought to get on the job and take care of the needs of the American people so we can open safely. All right. Your time is up, sir. Well, we are going to get to the... I have gonna, to respond to that. Well, you both had two minutes, sir. Excuse me. He made a statement. I, so did you. People want their schools... No, people want their schools open. They don't want to be shut down. They don't want their state shut down. They want their restaurants. I look at New York. It's so sad what's happening in New York. It's almost like a ghost town. And I'm not sure it can ever recover what they've done in New York. People want their places open. They want to get back to their lives. People They'll want be to careful, be safe. but they want their schools open. Okay. Want I'm the one safe. that brought back football. By the way, I brought back Big Ten <laughs> football. It was me, and it, I'm very happy to do it. And <laughs> All right, the people let's, of let's, Ohio let's, are very proud of me. And you know we're how get I back, that? When we're, gentlemen, we're going to get to your economic plans going forward in a moment. But first, Mr. President, as you well know, there's a new report that in 2016, the year you were elected president, and 2017, your first year as president, that you paid $750 a year in federal income tax each of those years. I know that you pay a lot of other taxes, but I'm asking you the specific question. Is it true that you paid $750 in federal income taxes each of those two years? I paid millions of dollars in taxes, millions of dollars of income tax. And let me just tell you, 
There was a story in one of the papers. Show I paid, your tax I paid $38 million one year. I paid $27 million Show us your tax year. returns. I went uh, — you'll see it as soon as it's finished. You'll see it. You know, oh. if you want to do, go to the Board of Elections. There's a 118-page or so report that says everything I have, every bank I have, I'm totally under-leveraged because the assets are extremely good. And we have a very — we have a — I built Sir, a great I'm asking company. you a specific question, which but is — But let me tell you — I understand all of that. I understand all of that. I, I understand all of that. But, but, but let me — No, Mr. President. Go ahead. I'm asking you a question. Will you tell us how much you paid in federal income taxes in 2016 and 2017? Millions of dollars. You paid millions of dollars? Millions in, of dollars, So yes. not $750. Millions of dollars. And you'll get to see I, it. I, and you'll get to when? see it. But let and me Shalom? just tell you — Chris, let me just tell you something, that it was the tax laws. I don't want to pay tax. Be before I came here, I was a private developer. I was a private business people. Like every other private person, unless they're stupid, they go through the laws, and that's what it is. He passed a tax bill that gave us all these privileges for depreciation and for uh, tax credits. We build a building and we get tax credits, like the hotel on Pennsylvania Avenue. You get okay. a massive — which, by the way, was given to me by the Obama administration, if you can believe that. Now, the man got yeah, fired no, 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 right look, after that happened, but Vice President all. Biden, you want to respond? Yeah, I do want to respond. Look, the tax code that made him put him in a position that he pays less tax than a school teacher makes — on the money a school teacher makes — is because of him take — he says he's smart because he can take advantage of the tax code. And he does take advantage of the tax code. That's why I'm going to eliminate the Trump tax cuts. And Good. we're going to — I'm going to eliminate those tax okay. cuts and make sure that we invest in the people who, in fact, need the help. People out there need help. But why didn't you do it over 20, uh, the no, last no, no. 25 Wait, years? No, because you are president. Because you are president, you you are president screwing no, no, things no, no. up. You were a senator. And You're the, the worst way, president vice... America has ever had. Hey, hey Come Joe, on. Let me, let me just tell you, Joe. I've done more in in 47 months. I've done more than you've done in 47 years, Joe. We've done things that you never even thought of doing, okay. including Gentlemen, fixing the broken military that you gave me, let's, including let's, taking care of we're your talking, Mr. President, we're talking about the economy. I'd like to ask you about your plans going forward, because, uh, Mr. Vice President, your economic plan, if you were to be yes, elected no. president, uh, focuses a lot on big government, big taxes, big spending. I want to focus first on the taxes. You propose more than $4 trillion over a decade in new taxes, on individuals making more than $400,000 a year and on corporations. President Trump says that that kind of an increase in taxes is going to hurt the economy as it's just coming out of a recession. Well, just take a look at what as the, the analysis has been done by Wall Street firms. Points out that my, my economic plan would create 7 million more jobs than his in four years, number one. And number two, it would create an additional $1 trillion in economic growth because it would be about buying American, that we have to — we're going to make — the federal government spend $600 billion a year on everything from ships to steel to buildings and the like. And under my proposal, we're going to make sure that every penny of that has to be made by a company But, but respectfully, in sir, I'm talking about taxes, not spending. Oh, well, uh, by the way, I'm going to eliminate a significant number of the tax. I'm going to make the, the, the corporate tax 28 percent. It shouldn't be 21 percent. You have 19 company, uh, 91 companies, federal — I mean, in the Fortune 500, who don't pay a single penny in tax, making billions of dollars. Why didn't you do it before billions when of dollars? you were vice president because, with Obama? Because you, in fact, passed that. That was right. your I tax it, proposal. I got it done. And you know what happened? Yeah, you got it done. Our economy boomed and, and, like it's and, never boomed The economy well, is Mr. busted. President, let, let me wait, finish. No, let me, Mr. President, let me pick up on that. You would continue your free market approach, lower taxes, more deregulation, correct? Not lower taxes American people. But, but, but let me — Excuse me. But in, but in Obama's — you talk about the economy booming. It turns out that in Obama's final three years as president, more jobs were created, a million and a half more jobs that in the first three years of your presidency. They had the slowest recovery since — <sighs> economic recovery since 1929. It was the slowest recovery. Also, they took over something that was down here. All you had to do is turn on the lights and you pick up a lot. But they had the well, slowest had... economic recovery since 1929. Let me tell you about the stock market. When the stock market goes up, that means jobs. It also means 401ks. 
if you got in, if you ever became president with your ideas, you want to terminate my tax, my taxes, I, I'll tell you what, you'll lose half of the companies that have poured in here will leave, and plenty half of companies, companies that are already here, they'll leave for other places. Have they will leave, and you will have a I depression mean, the I likes mean, of which you've never seen. Look, Mr. we Vice inherited it. The worst recession, short of a depression, in American history. I was asked to bring it back. We were able to have an economic recovery that created the jobs you're talking about. We handed him a booming economy. He blew it. It wasn't he booming. Blew it. He blew it. It wasn't booming. It, it, was, was, a, it was the weakest the, recovery well, sir, is since fair to, Wait, wait. Is it, fair to, is it fair to say he blew it when, in when fact, COVID there was no. when there was record un low unemployment yeah. before COVID? Yeah, but, but because what he did, even before COVID, manufacturing went in the hole. Manufacturing went in a hole. Excuse number me, one. Chris. Wait. Number two. Chris. Number three. They said they, it would take. Okay. No, you were number two. No. Chris, Chris. They said it would this take a miracle something. to bring back manufacturing. I brought back 700,000 jobs. They brought back nothing. They gave up on manufacturing. We Part did of not my regret. standard fare. I'm the guy that he brought totally back gave the automobile up on manufacturing. industry. All right, let him we brought back, I was asked to bring back Chrysler and General Motors. We brought them back right here in the state of Ohio and Michigan. He blew it. They're gone. He blew it. And in fact, they're going Ohio after had the best thing. year it's ever had last year. Michigan yeah. had the best year they've ever had. That is not Many true. Many car companies no, came no, in from Germany, from not, Japan, no, went to Michigan, no, went to no, Ohio. They're not having And Mr. they didn't Vice, come wait, in wait, with wait, you. Mr. Vice President, go ahead. And so you take a look at what he's actually done. He's done very little. His trade deals are the same way. He talks about these great trade deals. You know, he talks about the art of the deal. China's made perfected the art of the steel. We have a higher deficit with China now than we did before. We have the highest deficit trade deficit China with ate Mexico. Your lunch, All right, gentlemen, in, 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 China in, ate your lunch, uh, Joe. And but, no wonder okay. your son goes in and he takes out what he takes out billions oh. of dollars, takes out billions of dollars to manage. He makes millions of dollars. And also, Simply while we're at true. it, why Simply is it, true. just out of curiosity, the mayor of Moscow's wife gave your son three and a half million dollars. What did he true. do to deserve it? That what did he do with Barista to deserve that, wait, wait, 183 thousand dollars? None of that is question, true. Not an answer. If not, none of that is true. Oh, really? He totally didn't get three no, and a half million? Hey, Mr. President, he did. Totally, Mr. President, please. Totally discredited. It. Totally discredited. And by the way, well, wait, he didn't get three and a half million dollars, Joe. Mr. Vice he got three Mr. And a half President, dollars. it is not true. Oh, really? Here's, Mr. Oh, President, but, Mr. You, it's, a, it's an open discussion, please. Now, you, you, it's a fact. I, well, There's, you have raised an issue. Let the been totally Vice President answer. Discredited. Did Barista was pay him 183000 a, a month what, what, with what, no what, experience what, in energy? Mr. Look, President, with no job. my son did nothing wrong at Barista. I think he did. Mr. President, the only guy that let him answer. He doesn't want to let me answer because he knows I have the truth. His, his position has been totally, thoroughly discredited. By who? And you the can, media. By everybody. Well, by the, by media, the media, by our allies, by the World Bank, by, e by everyone has discredited. As a matter of Dude, fact, I, matter of fact, Mr. even Mr. the President, people who testified under oath. So let me ask oath, you this. Henry, you, no, no, oath, go ahead, Mr. Every, I'm listening to you. People under, you got three and a half he, million he dollars from Moscow. Te he testified under oath in his administration, said, I did my job and I did it very well. Oh, I really? did it I'd honorably. Like to know who they are. Every, well, I'll give you the list I'll of the people them. who testified. No, no, go ahead, sir. Sure, you, they, you've already fired most of them because they did some a good job. Some people don't well, do a good here's job. The, with you, go ahead. You got the the wait a minute. You get the final word, Mr. Well, it's hard to get any word in with this clown. Excuse me. This, hey, hey this let me person. just say to you. No, no, no. I'm no. Mr. President. Three and, I'm and a half Mr. million, President. Joe. That is simply. Why did not he true. deserve three and a half million it from did, Moscow? Look, here's the deal. We want to talk about families and ethics. I don't want to do that. I mean, his family, we could talk about all night. His family's my already... Family no, 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 let him go. My what, family already lost wrote. a fortune by coming down ahead. and helping go us ahead. with government. Ahead, and that's Every, such a... Right that's here, Mr. That's President. Such a great, Every single one of them lost a fortune. This is not about Mr. my family or his family. It's government. about your family. They the American like people. He doesn't... Nothing. That's not true. It doesn't want to talk about what you need, you, the American people. It's about you. That's what we're talking about. Here. All right, that's the, end of the, here. that's the end of the Shouldn't segment. We're, mo money. we're moving on. There's, he didn't take them. Well, Vice President, very, Chris, ex no. I, can I be honest? It's a very important try question. Try to be honest. No, I, he, I, stood good no, he stood I, up. No, the answer to the question is no. Ukraine. It, no, I, sir. With a billion sir, dollars, if you don't get rid of that, you know what? You're really not true. You're doing it. You're going to have true. Gentlemen. I hate to raise Chris, my voice, but it seems tape. to me, why shouldn't I be different than the two of you? So here's the That's deal. Good point. We have 
five, six segments. We have ended that segment. We're going to go to the next segment. In that segment, you each are going to have two uninterrupted moments. In those two interrupted minutes, Mr. President, you can say anything you want. I'm going to ask a question about race, but if you want to answer about something else, go ahead. But we, we, I think that the country would be better served if we allowed both people to speak with fewer interruptions. I, I'm appealing to you, sir, to do that. Well, and him too. Well, frankly, you've been doing more interrupting well, than he Well, that's all right, has. but he does plenty. Well, less than, <laughs> sir, yeah, less than, plenty. no, he less does. than you have. Let's please continue on. The issue of race. Vice President Biden, you say that President Trump's response to the violence in Charlottesville three years ago when he talked about very fine people on both sides was what directly led you to launch this run for president. Oh, yeah, sure. President Trump, you have often said that you believe you have done more for black Americans than any president with the possible exception of Abraham Lincoln. My question for the two of you is why should voters trust you rather than your opponent to deal with the race issues facing this country over the next four years? Vice President Biden, you go first. It's about equity and equality. It's about decency. It's about the Constitution. And we have never walked away from trying to require equity for everyone, equality for the whole of America. But we've never accomplished it. But we've never walked away from it like he has done. It is true. The reason I got in the race is when those people, close your eyes, remember what those people look like coming out of the fields carrying torches, their veins bulging, spewing, just spewing anti-Semitic bile and accompanied by the Ku Klux Klan. A young woman got killed. And they asked the president what he thought. He said there were very fine people on both sides. No president has ever Finish said anything statement. like that. Finish it, it is his now, two second, minutes, sir. Second point I'd make to you is that when Floyd was killed, when Mr. Floyd was killed, there was a peaceful protest in front of the White House. What did he do? He came out of his bunker, had the military do use tear gas on him so he could walk across to a church and hold up a Bible. And then what happened after that? The bishop of that very church said that it was the disgrace. The general who was with him said he all, he all he ever wants to do is divide people, not unite people at all. This is a president who has used everything as a dog whistle to try to generate racist hatred, racist division. This is a man who, in fact, you talk about helping African-Americans. One in 1,000 African Americans has been killed because of the coronavirus. And if he doesn't do something quickly, by the end of the year, one in 500 will have been killed. One in 500 African Americans. This man, this man is the, is the savior of African Americans? This man cares at all? This man's done virtually nothing. Look, the fact is that you have to look at what he talks about. You have to look at what he did. And what he did has been disastrous for the African-American community. So, Pre President Trump, you have two minutes. Why should Americans right. trust you over your opponent to deal with racism? He did a crime bill, 1994, where you call them super predators, African-Americans, the super predators. And they've never That's forgotten it. They've never forgotten it, Joe. No, no, sir. It's his two minutes. So you did that, and they call you a super predator. And I'm letting people out of jail now that you have treated the African-American population community, you have treated the black community about as bad as anybody in this country. You did the 1990, and that's why, if you look at the polls, I'm doing better than any Republican has done in a long time, because they saw what you did. You call them super predators, and you've called them worse than that, because you look back at your testimony over the years, you've called them a lot worse than that. As far as the church is concerned, and as far as the generals are concerned, we just got the support of 200 mil 250 military leaders and generals. Total support. Law enforcement, almost every law enforcement group in the United States. I have Florida, I have Texas, I have Ohio, I have every, excuse me, Portland. The sheriff just came out today and he said, I support President Trump. I don't think you have any law enforcement. You can't even say the word law enforcement because if you say those words, you're going to lose all of your radical left supporters. And why aren't you saying those words, Joe? Why don't you say the words law enforcement? Because you know what? If they called us in Portland, we would put out that fire in a half an hour, but they won't do it because they're run by radical left Democrats. If you look at Chicago, if you look at any place you want to look, Seattle, they heard we were coming in the following day and they put up their hands and we got back Seattle. 
Minneapolis, we got it back, Joe, because we believe in law and order, but you don't. The top 10 cities and just about the top 40 cities are run by Democrats and, in many cases, radical left. And they've got you wrapped around their finger, Joe, to a point where you don't want to say anything about law and order. And I'll tell you what, the people of this country want and demand law and order, and you're afraid to even say it. All right. I want, to, I want to return to the question of race. Vice President Biden, after the grand jury in the Breonna Taylor case, decided not to charge any of the police with homicide. You said it raises the question, quote, whether justice could be equally applied in America. Do you believe that there is a separate but unequal system of justice for blacks in this country? Yes, there is. There's, a, there's a systemic injustice in this country, in education, in work, and in, in, in law enforcement, and in the, in the way in which it's enforced. But look, the vast majority of police officers are good, decent, honorable men and women. They risk their lives every day to take care of us. But there are some bad apples. And when they occur, when they find them, they have to be sorted out. They have to be held accountable. They have to be held accountable. And what I'm going to do as President of the United States is call a, a, together an entire group of people at the White House, well, everything from the civil rights groups to the police officers, the police chiefs, and we're going to work this out. We're going to work this out so we change the way in which we have more transparency in when these things happen. These cops aren't happy to see what happened to, to, to George Floyd. These co cops aren't happy to see what happened to Breonna Taylor. Most don't like it. But we have to have a system where people are held accountable. When, and by the way, violence in response is never appropriate. Never appropriate. Peaceful protest is. Violence is never appropriate. All right, Ms. What is peaceful President, protest? When they run through the middle President, of the town Trump, and burn down President your stores Trump, I, and kill people President all over Trump, the place? That and you is say not peaceful, peaceful protest. President no, Trump, it's I'm not, not asking. But you say it is. I President Trump, I'd like to continue with yes, the issue right, of race. Please. I promise we're going to get to the issue of law and order please. in a moment. Fine. This month, your administration uh, directed federal agencies to end racial sensitivity training that addresses white privilege or critical race theory. Why did you decide to do that, to end racial sensitivity training? And do you believe that there is systemic racism in this country, sir? I ended it because it's racist. I ended it because a lot of people were complaining that they were asked to do things that were absolutely insane, that it was a radical uh, revolution that was taking place in our military, uh, in our schools, all over the place, and you know it, and so does what, everybody what, what else. Radical, and he would know. What is oh, radical totally about racist. racial sensitivity training? Sir. If you were a certain person, you had no status in life. It was sort of a reversal. And if you look at the people, we were paying people hundreds of thousands of dollars to teach very bad ideas and, frankly, very sick ideas. And, and really, they were teaching people to hate our country. And I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to allow that to happen. We have to go back to the core values of this country. They were teaching people that our country is a horrible place, it's a racist place, and they were teaching people to hate our country. And I'm no not going to did. allow that to happen. Vice President Biden? Nobody's doing that. He's just, he's oh, the you, racist. You, you just don't know. Here's the deal. I, I know a lot more about you this. Don't than he does. Let him finish. The fact is that there is racial insensitivity. People have to be made aware of what other people feel like. What, what insults them, what is demeaning to them. It's important that people know they don't want to. Many people don't want to hurt other people's feelings, but it's, it makes a big difference. It makes a gigantic difference in the way a child is able to grow up and have a, self, a sense of self-esteem. It's a little bit like how this guy and, and his friends look down on so many people. They look down their nose on people like Irish Catholics like me and grew up in Scranton. They look down on people who don't have money. They look down on people who are of a different faith. They look down on people who are a different color. In fact, we're all Americans. The only way we're going to bring this country together is bring everybody together. There's nothing we cannot do if we do it together. We can take this on and we can defeat racism Vice in America. President, I mean, President Trump, sir. During the Obama Biden administration, there was tremendous division. There was hatred. You look at uh, Ferguson, you look at, you go to very many places. Look at Oakland. Look what happened in Oakland. Look what happened in Baltimore. Look what happened. Frankly, it was more violent than what I'm even seeing now. Oh, my but Lord. the reason, 
this is, is that ridiculous. the Democrats that Absolutely run these cities ridiculous. don't want to talk like you about law and order. Violent and you crime. still haven't mentioned. Violent Are crime. you in favor of law and order? I'm in favor of law. You follow Are you in favor of law and order? Go yes, ahead, Senator. You, you asked a question, let him finish. Law and order. Law and order. Let him Law and order with justice, where people get treated fairly. And the fact of the matter is, violent crime went down 17 percent, 15 percent in our administration. All right. It's gone up on went, his watch. Went down he, much more he, he than had, ours. All right. We're, we're now, you're, Mr. President, Mr. President, you're going to be very happy. Mr. President, every record in the Mr. Book. President, you're going to be very happy because we're now going to talk about law and order. Because we had trouble. We're Democratic run cities. That's exactly my Democratic. question. There has been a dramatic increase in homicides in America this summer, particularly, and you often blame that on Democratic mayors and Democratic governors, but in fact, there have been equivalent spikes in Republican-led cities like Tulsa and Fort Worth. So the question is, is this really a party issue? I think it's a party issue. You can bring in a couple of examples, but if you look at Chicago, what's going on in Chicago, where uh, 53 people were shot and eight died, shot. If you look at New York, where it's going up like nobody's ever seen anything, the numbers are going up 100, 150, 200 percent. Uh, crime. It's, it is cities. crazy what's going on. Repub and he doesn't want to say law and order because he can't, because he'll lose his radical left supporters. And once he does that, it's over with. But well, if he ever good. got to run this country and they ran it the way he would want to run it, we would have we would our suburbs would be gone. By the suburbs. way, our suburbs would be gone, and you would see problems like you've he never seen. He would know a suburb unless he took a wrong turn. Oh, I know suburbs. He would not. So much I was better. Go, go ahead. I would, wait a minute. I was so raised in the suburbs. This is not 1950. All these dog whistles on racism don't work anymore. Suburbs are by and large integrated. There are as many people today driving their kids to soccer practice and or to uh, black and white and Hispanic in the same car as there have been any time in, in the past. What's, what really is a threat to the suburbs? and their safety, is his failure to deal with COVID. They're dying in the suburbs. His failure to deal with the environment. They're being flooded. They're being burned out because okay. his refusal to do anything. That's why the suburbs are in trouble. I, I do want to talk about this issue of law and order, though. And in the joint recommendation that came from the Biden-Bernie Sanders task force, you talked about, quote, reimagining policing. Yeah. First of all, what does reimagining policing mean, and do you support? It means. Uh, uh, let me, if I might finish the question. What does reimagining policing mean, and do you support the Black Lives Matter uh, call for, uh, for community control of policing? Look, what I support is the police having the opportunity to deal with the problems they face. And I'm, not, I'm totally opposed to defunding the police officers. As a matter of fact, police, local police, the only one defunding in his budget calls for a $400 million cut in local law enforcement assistance. They need more assistance. They need, when they show up for a 9-11 call, to have someone with them as a psychologist or psychiatrist to keep them from having to use force and be able to talk people down. We have to have community policing like we had before, where the officers get to know the people in the communities. That's when crime went down. It didn't go up. It went down. And so we have to be engaged. That's not what they're private. talking about, that's Chris. That's well, not what that, that's he's talking exactly, about, defunding the that, police. That is not true. He doesn't have any would, law would you, support. Look, he has no law enforcement that's support. That's not true. Almost that's nothing. Not, that, look. Oh, really, who do you have? Name one group that supports you. Name one group that came out and supported you. Go look, ahead. Look, think. We have time. We don't have time to do no, anything. No, no. Think so, about right. it. All right. Name folks, one law enforcement folks. group. That came well, I think, out and I think gentlemen, I think I'm going, to I'm going to take back the there moderator's are, role, and I, want, and I want to get to another subject, which is the issue of protests in many cities that have turned violent. In Portland, Oregon especially, we had a, more than 100 straight days of protests, which I think you would agree, you talk about peaceful protests, many of those turned We're into riots. Mr. Vice President, you say that people who commit crimes should be held accountable. The question I have, though, is, as the Democratic nominee, and earlier tonight you said that you are the Democratic Party right now, have you ever called the Democratic mayor of Portland or the Democratic governor of Oregon and said, hey, you've got to stop this, bring in the National Guard, do whatever it takes, but you stop the days and months of violence in Portland? I don't hold public office now. I am a former vice president. I've made it clear I've made it clear in my public statements that the violence should be prosecuted. 
It should be prosecuted. And anyone who commits it but should be prosecuted. But you've never called for the people, uh, the, the leader, that. excuse me, sir. You have never called for the leaders in Portland and in Oregon to call and bring they, in the National Guard and knock well, off 100 days of riots. They can, in fact, take care of it if he just stay out of the way. Oh, Look here. Oh, really? Here, oh, really? Here's well, the that, thing. Uh, no, I sent sir, in the no, wait, U.S. Marshals him a question. to get the killer no, of the no, young no, man no, in the middle of the street. No, they shot him. No, and for three Mr. days, President Trump, no, Portland President wouldn't Trump, do anything. I had to send in the U.S. Marshals. They took care of business. Go ahead, sir. And by the way. You know, his own former spokesperson said, you know, riots and chaos and violence help his cause. That's what this is all about. I don't know who said that. I do. Who? I think who? It, Kellyanne Conway. I don't think she said, she said that. She said that. And so here's the all right. point. But here's the point. Ahead, the point sir. is that that's what he is keeps trying to rile everything up. He doesn't want to calm things down. Instead of going in and talking to people and saying, let's get everybody together, figure out how to deal with this. What's he do? He just pours gasoline in the fire constantly and every single solitary okay, time. Okay, and, and to end this, button up this segment, I'm going to give you a minute to answer, sir. You have repeatedly well, criticized. Wait, I have to answer his statement. No, you have his repeatedly. Statement. Wait, you have repeat, no, you've been talking he back and forth. He made a statement. I'm asking you. I would a, love no, to you know, end sir, it. I would love to I, end I, it. I, you know, if you want to switch quick. seats. We, we could very quickly. We could do that, but I'd I'm not. Sending no, the National I, Guard, it would be over. There'd be no problem. Okay. But they don't want to accept the National Guard. You have repeatedly we, criticized the, the vice president for not specifically calling out Antifa and other left wing extremist right. groups. But are you willing tonight to condemn white supremacists and militia groups sure. and to say that they need to stand down and not? add to the violence in a number of these cities, as we saw in Kenosha and as we've seen in Portland. Sure, Are you I'm prepared to, to do specifically that, do it? Well, I, go would ahead, say, I would say almost everything I see is from the left wing. Not from the right so wing. So what are you? What are you, you look, what are you saying? I'm, I'm willing to do anything. I want to see well, peace. Then do it, sir. Say I'm, it. Do it. Say it. Do you want to call them? What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacists and, like and right boys. White supremacists and right boys. Stand back and stand by, but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left, because this is not a right-wing problem. His this own is a FBI left wing. director This said is a left-wing no, problem. Ahead, white supremacist. Antifa's an idea, not an organization. Oh, you got it, Not malicious. That's what oh, his it's an idea. FBI... His okay. FBI director Gentlemen, said. Well, we're then gonna, you know what? No, 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 we're done, we're done sir. Everybody, we're moving on to the next. We're moving on to the next. your administration. That's not an idea. Everybody Antifa in your administration tells you the truth is a, has a bad idea. Can I tell you what? You have no Antifa, ideas that are Antifa is a dangerous, radical All right, gentlemen, group. we're now moving on to the Trump and, and Biden records. With them. They'll overthrow you. When a president, I'm going to ask a question. When the president seeks a second term, it is generally a referendum on his record. But Vice President Biden, you like to quote one of your dad's sayings, which is, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. And in this case, sir, you are the alternative. Looking at both of your records, I'm going to ask each of you, why should voters elect you president over your opponent in this segment? President Trump, you go first, two minutes. Because there has never been an administration or president who has done more than I've done in a period of three and a half years. And that's despite the impeachment hoax. And you saw what happened today with Hillary Clinton, where it was a whole big con job. But despite going through all of these things, where I had to fight both flanks and behind me and, and above, there has never been an administration that's done what I've done. The greatest, before COVID came in, the greatest economy in history, lowest unemployment numbers. Everything was good. Everything was going. And by the way, there was unity going to happen. People were calling me for the first time in years. They were calling and they were saying, it's time maybe, and then what happened? We got hit, but now we're building it back up again. A rebuilding of the military, including Space Force and all of the other things. A, a fixing of the, the VA, which was a mess under him. 308,000 people died because they didn't have proper health care. He, he was a mess. And we now got a 91% approval rating at the VA, our vets. We take care of our vets. But we've rebuilt our military. The job that we've done, and, and I'll tell you something, some people say maybe the most important. By the end of the first term, I'll have approximately 300 federal judges and court of appeals judges, 300, and hopefully three great Supreme Court judges, justices. That is a record, the likes of which very few people, and you know one of the reasons I'll have so many judges? 
because President Obama and him left me 128 judges to fill. When you leave office, you don't leave any judges. That's like you just don't do that. They left 128 openings. And if I were a member of his party, because they have a little different philosophy, I'd say, if you left us 128 openings, you can't be a good president. You can't be a good vice president. But I want to thank you, because it gives us almost It'll probably be above that number by the end of this term. I'm sorry. 300 judges. It's a record. Looking at both your records, why should voters elect you president as opposed to President Under Trump? You have two minutes uninterrupted. Under this president, we become weaker, sicker, poor, more divided, and more violent. When I was vice president, we inherited a recession. I was asked to fix it. I did. We left him a booming economy, and he caused the recession. With regard to being weaker, the fact is that I've gone head-to-head -head with Putin and made it clear to him we're not going to take any of his stuff. He's Putin's puppy. He still refuses to even say anything to Putin about the bounty on the heads of American soldiers. Your son got and three no, no, no. million dollars. Mr. And by Mr. the way, Mr. my son— Mr. Wait a minute. Mr. President, your campaign agreed to— both sides would get two-minute answers uninterrupted. Well, your, your side agreed to it, and why don't you observe what your campaign agreed to as a ground rule, okay, sir? He never keeps his word. Can you add no, back, no, 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 I'm not asking. That, that was a rhetorical question. Can you Go add ahead, sir. Can you add back 30 seconds? Yeah, because, yes, okay. you may have. All right. Go ahead. So, thirdly, we're poor. The billionaires have gotten much, much more wealthy by a tune of over four, three to $400 billion more just since COVID. You in the home, you got less. You're in more trouble than you were before. In terms of being more violent, when we were in office, there were 15% less violence in America than there is today. He's president of the United States. It's on his watch. And with regard to more divided, the nation can't stay divided. We can't be this way. And speaking of my son, the way you talk about the military, the way you talk about them being losers and being and, 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 and just being suckers. My son was in Iraq. He spent a year there. He got the, he got the Bronze Star. He got the Conspicuous Service Medal. He was not a loser. He was a patriot. And the people left behind oh, there really? were heroes. Really? And I resent Are you talking like about Hunter? Hell. Are you talking about I'm Hunter? I'm talking about my son, Bo Biden. You're talking I don't about know. I don't know Bo. I know Hunter. Yeah, Hunter, you know got Bo. Thrown, Hunter got thrown out of the military. He was thrown out, dishonorably discharged. That's not true. For it wasn't dishonorable. Cocaine use, and he didn't have a job until you became vice president. And once you None became of vice president, true. he made a fortune in Ukraine, in China, in Moscow, that is simply and various not other places. True. He my made son, a fortune. Gentlemen, my son, and he didn't have a job. My son, like a lot of people, like a lot of people we know at home, had a drug problem. He's overtaken it. He's, he's, he's fixed it. He's worked on it. And I'm proud of him. But why was he given of tens of millions right. of dollars? But he wasn't given right. tens of millions of dollars. That is totally, that's been Trump. totally President discredited. Trump, you've already, this, we've already been through this. Totally already, discredited. We've, both, we've already been through this. I think the American people would rather hear about more substantial so subjects. Well, you know, yes. as the moderator, sir, I'm going to make a, know, a judgment when call here. Three and a half million okay, dollars right. from the Let's mayor talk about of Moscow. Let's talk that about is not I think true. It's a that thing. report is totally Why discredited. Did he get it? I, I, I Mitt think, Romney on that committee said it wasn't worth taxpayers' that, money. That report it was written for political you, reasons. You know, I'd like to talk about climate change. So would I. Okay. The forest fires in the West are raging now. They have burned millions of acres. They have displaced hundreds of thousands of people. When state officials there blame the fires on climate change, Mr. President, you said, I don't think the science knows. Over your four years, you have pulled the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Accord. You have rolled back a number of Obama environmental records. What do you believe about the science of climate change and what will you do in the next four years to confront it? I want crystal clean water and air. I want beautiful, clean air. We have now the lowest carbon. If you look at our numbers right now, we are doing phenomenally. But I haven't destroyed our businesses. Our businesses aren't put out of commission. If you look at the Paris Accord, it was a disaster from our standpoint. And people are actually very happy about what's going on because our businesses are doing well. As far as the fires are concerned, you need forest management in addition to everything else. 
the forest floors are loaded up with trees, dead trees that are years old and they're like tinder and leaves and everything else. You drop a cigarette in there, the whole forest burns down. You've got to have forest management. What do you You've believe? Got to have cuts. What do you believe about the science of climate change, sir? Uh, I believe that we have to do everything we can to have immaculate air, immaculate water, and do whatever else we can that's good. You know, we're planting a billion trees, the Billion Tree Project, and it's very exciting for a lot that, of people. You believe that human Pollution, gas, greenhouse gas emissions contributes to the global warming of this planet? I think planet? a lot of things do, but I think to an extent, yes. I think to an extent, yes. But I also think we have to do better management of our forests. Every year, I get the call, California's burning. California's burning. If that was cleaned, if that were, if you had forest management, good forest management, you wouldn't be getting those calls. You know, in Europe, they live their forest cities. They're called forest cities. They maintain their forests. They manage their forests. I was with the head of a major country. It's a forest city. He said, sir, we have trees that are far more, they, they ignite much easier than California. There shouldn't be that problem. I spoke with the governor about it. I'm getting along very well with the governor. But I said, you know, at some point, you can't every year have hundreds of thousands of acres of land just burned to the ground. But sir, That's but, burning down because of a lack of but management. But, sir, if you believe in the science of climate change, why have you rolled back the Obama Clean Power Plan, which limited carbon emissions in power plants? Why have you relaxed... Because it was driving you, energy prices through the sky. Why have you relaxed fuel economy standards that are going to create more pollution from cars well, and trucks. Well, not really, because what's happening is the car is much less expensive and it's a much safer car, and you're talking about a tiny difference, and then what would happen, because of the cost of the car, you would have at least double and triple the number of cars purchased. We have the old slugs out there that are 10, 12 years old. If you did that, the car would be safer, it would be much cheaper by $3,500. But $3, in, the, in the $3, they've simply No, but you would take your, a lot of cars now. off the market because people would be able to afford a car. Now, so, and by the way, we're gonna see how that turns out. But a lot of people agree with me, many people. The car has gotten so expensive because they have computers all over the place for an extra little bit okay. of gasoline. And, by the, and, and, and I'm okay with electric cars, too. I think I'm all for electric cars. I've given big incentives for electric cars. But what they've done in California is just all crazy. Right. Vice President Biden, I'd like you to, to respond to the president's climate change record. But I also want to ask you about a concern. You proposed $2 trillion in green jobs. You talk about new limits, not abolishing, but new limits on fracking, ending the use of fossil fuels to generate electricity by 2035, and zero net emission of greenhouse gases by 2050. The president says a lot of these things would tank the economy and cost millions of jobs. He's absolutely wrong, number one. Number two, if in fact, when, when our, during our administration, the Recovery Act, I was able to, I was in charge, able to bring down the cost of renewable energy to cheaper than or as cheap as coal and gas and oil. Nobody's going to build another uh, uh, coal-fired plant in America. No one's going to build another oil-fired plant in America. They're going to move to renewable energy, number one. Number two, we're going to make sure that we are able to take the federal fleet and turn it into a fleet that's run on their electric vehicles, making sure that we can do that. We're going to put 500,000 charging stations and all of the highways that we're going to be building in the future. We're going to build an economy that, in fact, is going to provide for the ability of us to take 4 million buildings and make sure that they, in fact, are weatherized in a way that, in fact, will, they'll, they'll emit significantly less gas and oil because the heat will not be going out. There's so many things that we can do now to create thousands and thousands of jobs. We can get to net zero in terms of energy production by 2035, not only not costing people jobs, creating jobs, creating millions of good paying jobs, not 15 bucks an hour, but prevailing wage by having a new infrastructure that, in fact, is green. And the first thing I will do, I will rejoin the Paris Accord. I will join the Paris Accord because with us out of it, look what's happening. It's all falling apart. 
And talk about someone who has no, no relationship to, with foreign policy. Brazil, the rainforests of Brazil are being torn down, are being ripped down. More, more carbon is absorbed in that rainforest than every bit of carbon that's emitted in the United States. Instead of doing something about that, I would be gathering up and making sure we had the, com the countries of the world coming up with $20 billion and say, here's $20 billion, stop, stop tearing down the forest. And if you don't, then you're going to have significant economic consequences. What about, consequences what about the trade. argument that President Trump basically says that you have to balance environmental interests and economic interests, and he's drawn his line? Well, he hadn't drawn a line. He still, for example, makes sure that we, he wants to make sure that methane's not a problem. We can, you, you can now emit more methane without it being a problem. Methane. This is a guy who says that you don't have to have mileage standards for automobiles that exist now. This is a guy who says that, well, the fact that it, 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 it's all true. And here's He's the talking deal. about the Green he, New Deal. And it's not two billion I'm, or 20 billion, as you said. I'm it's. One hundred trillion dollars. I'm talking about where they the want to Biden rip down plan. buildings go for a and, that, you can go. and rebuild the building. No, it's the dumbest, is not, most ridiculous. That is not where airplanes are out of business, that's it. where two car systems are out, where not they want true. to take out the cows too. Not you know that's true. not true either, right? Not this true. is a this is a one hundred trillion. Look, that's more money than our is, country could make. In a hundred years, if we're not going to the case. All right, let me, let me, let me, let me destroy because, our because country. I actually, wait a minute, sir. I actually <laughs> have studied your plan, and it includes upgrading four million buildings, weatherizing yes. two million homes over four years, building one and a half million energy efficient homes. So the question becomes, some, the president is saying, I think some people who support the president would say that sounds like it's going to cost a lot of money and hurt the economy. What it's going to do is going to create thousands and millions of jobs, good paying jobs. What, let him finish, sir. He doesn't know how to do that. $100 they, trillion. Dollars. The fact is it's going to create millions of good paying jobs and these tax incentives to people, for people to weatherize, which he wants to get, get rid of. It's going to make the economy much safer. Look how much we're paying now to deal with the hurricanes. With the deal with, by the way, he has an answer for hurricanes. He said maybe we should drop a nuclear weapon on them. They may. I never said that That's at all. He did you say You made that. it up. Uh, and here's the deal. You make up a we, lot of We are going to be in a position where we can create hard, hard, good jobs by making sure the environment is clean and we all are in better shape. We spend billions of dollars now, billions of dollars on floods, hurricanes, rising seas. We're in real trouble. Look what's happened just in the Midwest with these storms that come through and wipe out entire sections and counties in Iowa. They didn't happen before. They're because of global warming. We make up 15% of the world's problem. We, in fact, but the, the rest of the world, we've got to get them to come along. That's why we have to get back into, back into the Paris Accord. All right, gentlemen, well, wait we, a minute, Chris. So why didn't he do it for 47 years? You were vice president. Why didn't you get the world? China sends up real dirt into the air. Russia does, India does, they all do. We're supposed to be good. And by the way, he made a couple of statements. The Green New Deal is a hundred trillion dollars. That is not, not my billion. plan. That's the Green uh, well, New you Deal. Well, you want to rebuild every building. You want to rebuild right. every. If he knew anything about, about if he knew anything about, he made a statement about the military. He said, "I said something about the military." He and his friends made it up, and then they went with it. I never said it. Okay, that is what not he true. did. Sir, is he you're said, done in this segment. He called Mr. the military Vice, Mr. Vice stupid President. bastards. I, I and did he said not it on say tape. It. He uh, said Mr. stupid uh, please, bastards. No, he sir, said it. Stop. I would never say I would that. Play to it. Stop. Play it. Go ahead, Mr. You're Vice President. Uh, answered his qu his final question. The final question is, I can't remember which of all his rantings. <laughs> I'm, having much. I'm having a little trouble That's myself. Right. But, yeah. uh, and, and about the economy and about this question of what it's going to cost. The, the economy. The econo I mean, the Green New Deal the, and the, the idea of what, what the, your the environmental changes deal, will do. The Green New Deal will pay for itself as we move forward. We're not going to build plants that, in fact, are great polluting plants. Could you We're support build the Green New Deal? Pardon me? You support that? No, I don't support the Green oh, New Deal. Oh, you don't? Oh, well, well that's a big let, statement. I support that means the you just lost the no. radical left. I, su okay. I support oh, the don't. Biden plan that I put forward. Okay. The Biden plan, which is different than what he calls the radical Green New Deal. All right, gentlemen, final segment, election integrity. As we meet tonight, millions of Americans are receiving mail-in ballots or going to vote early. How confident? 
should we be that this will be a fair election? And what are you prepared to do over the next five plus weeks, because it'll not only be to election day, but also counting some ballots, mail-in ballots after election day. What are you prepared to do to reassure the American people that the next president will be the legitimate winner of this election in this final segment? Mr. Vice President, you go first. Prepared to let people vote. They should go to IWillVote.com. Decide how they're going to vote, when they're going to vote, and what means by which they're going to vote. His own Homeland Security Director, and as well as the FBI Director, says there is no evidence at all that mail-in ballots are a source of, of being manipulated and cheating. They said that. The fact is that there are going to be millions of people because of COVID that are going to be voting by mail-in ballots, like he does, by the way. He sits behind the Resolute desk and sends his ballot to Florida, number one. Number two, we're going to make sure that those people who want to vote in person are able to vote because there are enough poll watchers are there to make sure they can socially distance. The polls are open on time, and their polls stay open until the votes are counted. And this is all about trying to dissuade people from voting because he's trying to con to scare people into thinking that it's not going to be legitimate. Show up and vote. You will determine the outcome of this election. Vote, vote, vote. If you're able to vote early in your state, vote early. If you're able to vote in person, vote in person. Vote whatever way is the best way for you, because you will. He cannot stop you from being able to determine the outcome of this election. And in terms of whether or not when the votes are counted and they're all counted, that will be accepted. If I win, that will be accepted. If I lose, that will be accepted. But by the way, if in fact he says he's not sure what he's going to accept, well, let me tell you something. It doesn't matter because if we get the votes, it's going to be all over. He's going to go. He can't stay in power. It won't happen. It won't happen. So vote. Just make sure you understand you have it in your control to determine what this country is going to look like the next four years. Is it going to change or you get four more years of these lies? Mr. President, two minutes. So when I listened to Joe talking about a transition, uh, there's been no transition from when I won. I won that election. And if you look at crooked Hillary Clinton, if you look at all of the different people, uh, there was no transition because they came after me trying to do a coup. They came after me spying on my campaign. They started from the day I won and even before I won, from the day I came down the escalator with our first lady. They were a disaster. They were a disgrace to our country. And we've caught them. We've caught them all. We've got it all on tape. We've caught them all. And by the way, you gave the idea for the Logan Act against General Flynn. You better take a look at that, because we caught you, in a sense. And President Obama was sitting in the office. He knew about it, too. So don't tell me about a free transition. As far as the ballots are concerned, it's a disaster. A solicited ballot OK, solicit it is OK. You're soliciting. You're asking. They send it back. You send it back. I did that. If you have an unsolicited, they're sending millions of ballots all over the country. There's fraud. They found them in creeks. They found some with the name Trump. Just happened to have the name Trump just the other day in a waste paper basket. They're being sent all over the place. They sent two in a Democrat area. They sent out a thousand ballots. Everybody got two ballots. This is going to be a fraud like you've never seen. The other thing, it's nice on November 3rd, you're watching and you see who won the election. And I think we're going to do well because people are really happy with the job we've done. But you know what? We won't know. We might not know for months because these ballots are going to be all over. Take a look at what happened in Manhattan. Take a look at what happened in New Jersey. Take a look at what happened in Virginia and other places. They're not losing 2 percent, 1 percent, which, by the way, is too much. An election could be won or lost with that. They're losing 30 and 40 percent. It's a fraud and it's a shame. And can you imagine where they say uh, you have to have your ballot in by November 10th? November 10th. That means that's seven days after the election, in theory, should have been announced. OK, we have it major has, states no, time, with that. Uh, sir, all run by two Democrats. Minutes is two minutes. All run you're, by you're, Democrats. It's President a Trump, it's a rigged I, I, election. I, I, you're going to be able to continue. You have been charging for months that mail-in balloting is going to be a disaster. You say it's rigged, yes. that it's going to lead to fraud. But in 2018, in the last midterm election, 31 million people voted mail-in voting. That was a quarter, more than a quarter, of all the voters that year cast their ballots by mail. Now that millions of mail-in ballots have gone out, what are you going to do about it? And are you counting on the Supreme Court 
including a Justice Barrett, to settle any dispute. Yeah, I, th I think I'm counting on them to look at the ballots, definitely. I don't think we'll, I hope we don't need them in terms of the election itself. But for the ballots, I think so. Because what's happening is incredible. I just heard, I read today, where at least 1% of the ballots for 2016 were invalidated. They they take them. We don't like them. We don't like them. But they what are you throw do them about out. If left there are right. millions of ballots going out what right now, what you do is you, you go do? and vote. You do a solicited ballot. No, no, and that's I'm not, okay. I know or your you complaint. go and vote. I'm asking you about the fact that millions of people you go have and vote. You go and no, vote, but like what they, I'm saying is, what like are you they used to the in the old. Millions of people. You either do, Chris, a solicited ballot where you're sending it in. They're sending it back, and you're sending. They have mailmen with lots of it. Did you see what's going on? Take a look at West Virginia mailmen selling the ballots. They're being sold. They're being dumped in rivers. This is a horrible thing for our country. There is no. This is not. There is no. This is not going to end well. There is okay. no evidence This is not that. going Vice to President end well. Five states in fact, have had mail-in ballots for the last decade or more. Five, including two Republican states, and you don't have to solicit the ballot. It's sent to you. It's sent to your home. What we're saying is, they're saying is that it has to be a postmark by the time by election day. If it doesn't get in till the 7th, 8th, 9th, it still should be counted. He's just afraid of counting the votes because you're he knows wrong. the outcome. You're wrong. You're wrong. I, no, I, I want to continue with you on I this, love yeah, Vice President vote. Biden. Because Chris, he's so wrong in, when he makes a statement fact, no, like that. Excuse me. Vice President Biden, the biggest problem, in fact, over the years with mail-in voting has not been fraud historically. It has been that sizable numbers, sometimes hundreds of thousands of ballots are thrown out because they have not been properly filled out or there is some other irregularity or they missed the deadline. So the question I have is, are you concerned that the Supreme Court with a Justice Barrett will settle any dispute? I am concerned that any court would settle this because here's the deal. When you, when you file, when you get a ballot and you fill it out, you're supposed to have an affidavit. If you didn't know, you have someone say that this is me. You should be able to, if in fact you can verify that's you when the, before the ballot is thrown out, that's sufficient to be able to count the ballot because someone made a mistake and not dotting the correct I. Who they voted for, testify, say who they voted for, say it's you, that is totally legitimate. All right. Excuse final, me, no, no, no. when you I have, have a 80 final, million I, ballots gentlemen, I have a final sent in and swamping the I, I, system, you, 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 you know you, it can't be done. You know it can't. And already all right. there's been so now fraud. Mail service final, delivers 185 million ballots. Wait a minute, gentlemen. In the final question is, in eight ballots. states, we can keep talking. It's, it's in a, eight it's states, election workers are Earth. prohibited, currently by law, eight states, from even beginning to process ballots, even take them out of the envelopes and yes. flatten them until election day. That means that it's likely, because there's going to be a huge increase in mail-in balloting, that we are not going to know on election night who the winner is, that it could be days, it could be weeks, could be months. until we find out who the, the, the new president is. So I, first for you, sir, finally for the, for the vice president, I hope neither of you will interrupt the other. Will you urge your supporters to stay calm during this extended period, not to engage in any civil unrest, and will you pledge tonight that you will not declare victory until the election has been independently certified? President Trump, I'm you go first. I'm urging my supporters to go into the polls and watch very carefully, because that's what has to happen. I am urging them to do it. As you know, today there was a big problem. In Philadelphia, they went in to watch. They were they're called poll watchers, a very safe, very nice thing. They were thrown out. They weren't allowed to watch. You know why? Because bad things happen in Philadelphia, bad things. And Are I you? am urging, I am urging my people. I hope it's going to be a fair election. If it's a fair You're election, I am 100 percent on board. But if I see tens of thousands of ballots being manipulated, I can't go along with that. And I'll tell and what, you what, what does that from mean, a common sense, does that mean you're I'll going tell you to tell what it means. To take to it means street? you have a fraudulent election. You're and sending you out 80 do? million ballots. They're not, they're not equipped. To, these people aren't equipped to handle it, number one. Number two, okay. they cheat. They cheat. Hey, they found ballots in a waste paper basket three so, days ago, and they all had the name right. military ballots. They were military. They all had the name Trump on them. Uh, Vice President you think Biden, that's good? Uh, Vice President Biden, final question for you. Will you urge your supporters to stay calm while the vote is counted? And will you pledge not to declare victory until the election is independently certified? Yes. And here's the deal. We count the ballots, as you pointed out. 
some of these ballots in some states can't even be opened until Election Day. And if there's thousands of ballots, it's going to take time to do it. And by the way, our military, they've been voting by ballots for since at the end of the Civil War, in effect. In effect. And that's, and that's what's happen, going to happen. Why was it not, why is it for them somehow not fraudulent? It's the same process. It's honest. No one has established at all that there is fraud related to mail-in ballots, that the, somehow it's a fraudulent process. It's already been established. It, a, Take well, a look at Carolyn no, Maloney's I, 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 race. I asked you, you yeah. had an opportunity look to at respond. Look at Carolyn Maloney. Go ahead. They have no idea what Vice happened. Vice President Biden, go ahead. He has no idea what he's talking about. Here's the deal. The fact is, I will accept it, and he will too. You know why? Because once the winner is declared after all the, all the ballots are counted, all the votes are counted, that'll be the end of it. That'll be the end of it. And if it's me, in fact, fine. If it's, if it's not me, I'll support the outcome. And I'll be a president not just for the Democrats. I'll be a president for Democrats and Republicans. And this guy, I want to see fact, an honest okay. ballot count. Gentlemen, we, you say that's the end Chris, of it. This is the I end of this see an debate. Honest ballot count. We're and going I to think leave he it there. Too. Uh, I, to be continued as in more debates as we go on. Uh, president Trump, Vice President Biden. It's been an interesting hour and a half. I want to thank you both for participating. In the first of three debates that you have agreed to engage in, we want to thank Case Western Reserve University yes. and the Cleveland Clinic for hosting this event. The next debate, sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates, will be one week from tomorrow, October 7th, at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. The two vice presidential nominees, Vice President Mike Pence and Senator Kamala Harris, will debate at 9 p.m. Eastern that night. We hope you watch. Until then, thank you and good night. Thank you. Trump, the greatest president of all time. Yeah, yeah. We love you, Trump.